Jesus, this morning, we stand together in adoration, declaring, Jesus, that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We come into agreement with each other, declaring that you are the only one worthy, that even now, innumerable angels, seraphim and cherubim, they are declaring Jesus of Nazareth, holy, 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 the Lord God Almighty. And we join in this morning saying, Jesus, you are the glorious one. You are the one from eternity past, the firstborn of all creation, the firstborn of the dead. You who are the beginning, and you who are the end, and we worship you this morning. Father, because of the blood of Jesus, we also come before your throne with boldness. Not by anything that we've done, but because your blood, Jesus, is powerful. Because your blood can wash away sins. Even, even sinners like us can be made clean. And so we come with boldness this morning and we ask. Jesus, we ask with boldness that you would send the Holy Spirit now. That he would do what he loves to do. That he would take what is of Jesus and he would give it to us. That we would be able to see with the eyes of our hearts the glory and the beauty of Jesus and we would be able to be transformed into that same image from one degree of glory to another. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for coming. Thank you that you are the exact representation of the Father, the image of the invisible God. Father, we ask this morning that you would have preeminence, that you would have preeminence in this message, that you would be supreme in this church. Father, I pray in every aspect, Jesus would have preeminence in this church, that he would be preeminent in preaching, that he would be preeminent in our Sunday school, that he would be preeminent in every ministry of this church. And Jesus, we ask, we ask that you would come. We want you back on this earth, Jesus. And we cry out, the spirit and the bride, they say come, and we say come, Jesus. We ask all this in the name of Jesus, amen. So a little context of the, the book of Colossians. It's a church that Paul has never been to, and he knew a lot of people that um, were there, and he knew the, the founder of the church, Epaphras, who was his co-worker in the gospel. And although he had never been there, during one of Paul's lengthy prison uh, stays, Epaphras came and, and, and told him, here's what's happening in the, in the uh, Colossians church. And so the letter to the book of, uh, to, the, to the Colossians is Paul's response. And just like any time where you can only hear half a conversation, we kind of have to guess at what's going on. But from the text, we can find out some things were happening. Number one, they're tempted to go back to idol worship. Number two, the the circumcision group has come in. And this is a group that, that says, yes, you have to believe in Jesus, but you also have to do X, Y, Z, namely be circumcised and follow Jewish law. And so Paul's response is going to come in this book. But before he gets to the issue that he wants to get to, he first establishes a, Christ, a Christological passage, a, a passage about the glory and the beauty of Jesus. And this is a theme throughout the New Testament. Be before the writer of Hebrews gets into all the things that, that's important to him and that he wants to get to, he first writes Hebrews 1, which is a glorious passage of Jesus. Before Paul talks about the issues with the Philippians, he's going to do Philippians 2, which is a glorious passage about Jesus. The Gospel of John is written, and it's got a glorious passage about Jesus. And so this morning, I would love to spend some time working through these six verses, um, some of my favorites, and I just want to behold the Lamb with you guys this morning and just, just behold who he is and just enjoy Jesus of Nazareth. So let's begin. Verse 15, who is the image of the invisible God? Now, just to make sure we understand this who is, is we look at verse 13, who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. 
in whom, talking about Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. So verse 15, we could say, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. A.W. Tozer very famously said, one of the most important things that will determine the rest of your life is when you close your eyes and you imagine what God is like, that's going to determine how you walk out your Christian faith. So I want you to go ahead and do that now. Close your eyes and just imagine what God is like. If you're given to napping, you can imagine with your eyes open. That's fine. Okay, open your eyes if you haven't done so already. And uh, uh, we're not going to go through and ask each person kind of what they saw when they imagined God. But I'll tell you what a lot of Christians see. One is like a Zeus-type figure, uh, kind of a stoic statue in a temple, in a cloud, real high up in the air. The other one is like a Santa Claus kind of figure that's really kind and wants to give good gifts, but he also has a list of things that you're doing wrong. The other one is more ethereal. Some Christians, they, they close their mind or they close their eyes and they imagine kind of God as like a mysterious blue light or a, maybe a, a yellow cloud up in the sky. But the New Testament writers are very clear on what you should imagine when you close your eyes and you imagine what God is like. You guys ready for this? When you close your eyes and you imagine what God is like, you should see a Jewish carpenter. The writer of Hebrews says, Jesus is the exact representation of the Father. Here in Colossians 15, it says, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. You can see this in um, John 14. Remember, this is the Last Supper, and Jesus is talking to his disciples. He's about to be, he's about to be taken to the cross. And Philip says this thing. He says, well, Jesus, just show us the Father, and that will be enough. And you can almost hear pain in Jesus' voice when he says, Philip, how long have I been with you? When you see the Father, you see me. So for us, one of the most important things for us is when we imagine what God is like, we see Jesus of Nazareth, the carpenter. And it's beautiful, beloved, because we don't have to guess. Before Jesus arrived on the, she on the scene, Guessing what God was like was a truncated and shadowy affair, but now we know exactly what he's like. And when we read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we can know exactly what God is like because everything he says and everything he does is exactly what God the Father is like. And this should be a blessing to us, that we, can, we with confidence can know God in every aspect. And it's not, it's not, a, it's not an accident that, that the New Testament begins with Four stories of Jesus of Nazareth telling the same story from different aspects. We are meant to, to understand God by gazing upon the person of Jesus of Nazareth. Come on. All right, let's take a look at our next section. He's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Or, or modern translation says, he's the firstborn of all creation. What does that mean? The firstborn of all creation. Think about that for a second. What is, what is that? The firstborn of all creation. Well, if you're like me, that was just confusing. For, for years of my life, I thought, what, what does that mean? I'll tell you what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that Jesus is part of creation. Because he, he, he's the one that did creation. We're going to get to that a little bit later. So what does that mean? The firstborn of all creation. And Paul's getting this from Psalm 89. If you brought your own Bible, you can write a little note to yourself there. This comes from Psalm 89. If you have a pew Bible, I would ask that you not write in the pew Bibles, please. So the firstborn of all creation, and, and it goes back to Genesis and, and the drama between the brothers. What was the big deal with Jacob and Esau, right? Jacob sold his birthright. Jacob was, or Esau sold his birthright. Esau was the firstborn. So what does this mean? This, is, this truth is, is so blessed to me, beloved. Jesus has the inheritance rights. And Jesus is the firstborn. Now, now for our culture, it's, it's not the same. But I got to witness this a little bit when my grandpa Sedgel died. And my dad, 
as the firstborn brother, he had to distribute the inheritance on behalf of his deceased father. Beloved, when Jesus returns to the earth, he is going to distribute the inheritance. He is, he is the executor of the estate. He has the firstborn distribution rights. And I love this about him. And, and, and he, in, in all the, the, the gospel writings, he says these outrageous things, right? Oh, hey, you were faithful in, in that little bit of money? Okay, I'm going to give you five cities. <laughs> Beloved, he, he's not exaggerating. This is not a metaphor. He, he really is going to give five cities. He is the firstborn of all creation. And at his return, on behalf of the Father, he's the executor of state. This, this, is, this is glorious. And if you walk out your, your faithfulness, if you walk out obedience to him, he is going to richly reward you. And, and the topic of rewards is a massive topic in the New Testament. Because we're rooted in, in the Reformation and the good things that happened there, sometimes Christians will think, well, I don't need any rewards. I just want to be with Jesus. But when you say that, you, you actually put yourself above the teaching of Jesus. You actually say, well, maybe he said that to other people, but I, I don't need to worry about rewards. No, beloved, the, the idea of rewards is what's going to keep you it's what's going to give you the strength to pick up your cross and follow him. In the writer of Hebrews, in Hebrews 11, that's how he frames faith. Not just that you, you have a mental assent to who, who God is, but that you believe that he is and that he's what? A rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Beloved, rewards are what keeps us on the straight and narrow. It's what's going to, be, it's what's going to give you the strength to pick up your cross and follow him knowing that Jesus sees it and that he's going to reward you at his return. Because if, if, if there's no rewards, then it feels like injustice, right? Somebody says some nasty things about you. And if you don't believe Jesus watches and that he's going to reward you for responding in meekness, you're going to respond back to that person. But the beauty of, of the message of Jesus as the firstborn of all creation is that he sees and he diligently rewards us for it. Okay, so we got verse 1 done. Verse 16. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. When you imagine Genesis 1, and you, you can read through Genesis 1 and you can maybe see the spirit hovering over the waters or you can imagine the, Jesus creating all things with his, with his voice. We need to imagine Jesus doing that. The New Testament writers are clear. For, for Jewish people at the time of Jesus, the defining feature about who was God was that he was the creator. He's the creator, everything else is just the creation. And for them, the New Testament writers, they point over and over and over again that it's Jesus of Nazareth who is the creator of all things. Um, I, I love the, the, the children's, the Jesus Story Children's Bible. I know probably a lot of parents have it here. And a lot of times when I read children's Bibles to my kids, I kind of have to like edit them a little bit because I don't, I don't really like the way they say that theologically. But the writer of the, the children's story, the Jesus Storybook Bible, I think it's called, it got it right. And it tells the story of, of I think, in the, the, the Gospel of Mark, where Jesus calms the storm, right? And it, it says, the disciples are worried. They think they're going to drown, so they wake up Jesus. Jesus says, peace be still. And it says, I love the way the authors wrote, wrote this. It says, and of course, the wind and the waves obeyed Jesus. They obeyed Jesus' voice because it was the same voice that created them. When I read that to my son the first time, I just, I just almost closed the book and I was just like, thank you. Thank you, whoever the author of that book is, because you got it right. It's Jesus of Nazareth that has created all things. It, it was his voice at the beginning that created the heavens and the earth. 
And this is glorious to me. It should be glorious to you that the same one who died on the cross is also the creator of all things. And before we move on to to other verses, there's a a verse in in chapter 1 that I love. It it talks about how Jesus, uh, chapter 1 of Genesis 1, sorry. It, it, It talks about how Jesus made the sun and the moon. And then at the very end of the verse, Moses or whoever wrote the book of Genesis has, has this little phrase. It says, and he also made the stars. <laughs> Beloved, do you have any idea how many stars there are? I, I, looked at, I googled it earlier on this week, and it, it, scientists estimate there is 100,000 billion stars. <laughs> and it says, he made the sun and the moon, and the, the light was the day and the night, And he also made the stars. Kind of like Jesus is is creating all things, and he's like, well, I still got a couple hours. I'll go ahead and make 100,000 billion stars. This is the God that we serve. And when you come to him and you ask him for things, you can ask him for big things. I got a friend that I pray with sometimes, and and we'll, we'll be praying together, and he'll just pray for these outrageously big things. He'll say things like, And Jesus, I just pray that everyone in Peoria gets saved this weekend. And in my mind, when I'm praying, I'm kind of like, that's that's kind of outrageous, right? But but it actually reveals his understanding of Jesus of Nazareth. Because he also made the stars. 100,000 billion stars in just the afternoon. Come on, beloved. Let's keep going with Jesus as the creator. Uh, Things that are in heaven... Whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And that, that last little phrase I want to talk about, that all things were created by him and for him. So we, so we know he made everything, but he actually made it for himself. So, some people will say, well, you know, the creation is, is a witness, and, and that's true to who he is, but he actually made it for himself. He really likes creation. Do you know what he called his creation in Genesis? Good, 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 very good. Do you know Jesus loves his creation? And, and he loves it more than we do. You, you guys can think of something beautiful about creation. You think, oh, that, that's just wonderful. Well, Jesus actually loves that more than you. And, and when we gaze upon creation, yes, we get to see his handiwork, but we also get to see something that he loves. And it, it really does declare Not only the creator because of his creation, but what he loves. Steph and I were at the um, Grand Canyon during sunset. I don't know if you've ever had the opportunity to to do that, but it was beautiful. And it was glorious watching a a million colors change with the sunset. And, And when I'm watching this, my heart is just soaring for love for God. And and afterwards I was thinking about how how interesting it is because it had nothing to do with me. It wasn't because I, I was anything. I was gazing upon something much more beautiful and, and glorious, and it, and it was just me watching it. Beloved, this is the same when we gaze upon Jesus. And, and it's kinda, it kind of throws in the face. It, it, it's against what's, what's been happening in the American culture where we tell people, hey, you should become a Christian because your life will get better, because God will heal you, or God will save your marriage, or God will fix your finances. Well, those, those things may be true, but the reason that we worship Jesus is because he's glorious, because he is the holy, righteous one. And what we see now is just a picture of what he will do at the restoration of all things. Beloved, I love this. In Romans 8, where it talks about all creation is groaning for the sons of men to be revealed. The the, the rocks and the trees and whatever beautiful thing you love to gaze upon, it, it actually wants to be restored at the restoration of all things. When Jesus comes back, He's going to restore these things. There's so many Christians that believe that that God is kind of like going to death star the world. He's not. He's not. He's not going to destroy all things, beloved. He's going to restore all things. At the end of the story, it says, Behold, 
I make all things new. Beloved, this is going to be fantastic. Let's keep going. Verse 17. And he is before all things. I love this about Jesus. Do you know Jesus has memories of what it was like before the creation of the world? I love that in John 17, they they have left the upper room. And actually, Scripture doesn't tell us where they are. They haven't arrived at the Garden of Gethsemane yet, but they've left the upper room. And so there's a bunch of different theories. And I have an opinion. If you're interested after the message, I can tell you. But they're praying together in, 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 in John 17. And we get this beautiful picture of when God prays to God. I love John 17. And in this prayer, Jesus starts it out. And he says, I, don't, I haven't memorized it, so I'm going to mess it up a little bit. But the heart is like, Father, I remember the glory that I, ha- that I shared with you before the foundations of the world. <laughs> now, um, I think Mike recently talked about maybe peeking during prayers. But I just can imagine John and Peter during this prayer, you know, they're kind of like praying. It's, it's past midnight already, so hopefully they're standing up so they don't sleep. And Jesus prays, uh, Father, I remember the glory that we shared before the foundation of the world. And I can just imagine John being like, did, you, did, you, did he just say he remembers the glory that he shared with the Father before the foundations of the world? And I imagine these guys just being like, who is this man? What is he like? Jesus was, is before all things. And, and whenever you see all things in Scripture, it's a reference to Genesis 1, 1-1, one, one, right? He created the heavens and the earth and all things in between. Okay, next one. We're still on verse 17 here. And by him, all things consist. Or modern translations will say, and, and, and through him, he holds everything together. Scientists would say, you're just a bunch of molecules bouncing around. And the reason that you don't just float off into to, to space is because Jesus is currently holding you together. <laughs> it, the uh, creationists will talk about this as the watchmaker theory because some people believe God created, like a, like a watchmaker makes a watch, sets it in motion, and then kind of watches it tick. That's not what Jesus is. He creates all things And he is currently sustaining all things. The reason your heart is beating right now is because he wills your heart to beat. And the moment your your heartbeat stops, it's because he no longer wants your heartbeat to beat. The oxygen in your lungs, the gravity you feel right now is because Jesus is currently doing those things right now. He is sustaining all things, beloved. And And a a story that I like to use to illustrate this is the axe head story from from Elisha. Have you guys, do you guys know this story? It's just a really short one. It's, and it's, it's, it's good because it reveals kind of how we think about Jesus and and his creation. So Elijah's with some of his guys and this guy's got an axe and he's cutting down a tree, he's cutting something and he goes to like take another swing and the axe head falls off the stick and it flies into the river. And so he says to Elijah, Elijah, that was a borrowed axe. Like, I, I need to, like, give this back. And so Elijah, he prays, and he puts, like, I don't, I don't know the story that great, but he, he, he puts a stick in the water, and the axe head floats. Now, if you ask most Christians and say, you know, kind of what was God doing behind the scenes there? Most, most Christians will think, well, God kind of broke in, and he grabbed the axe, and he made it float. But that's not what that's not the, the biblical view of is at all. The biblical view is that God right now, Jesus right now, is currently sustaining all things, putting gravity on all things. And so what did he do? Well, he just didn't do the gravity that he normally does on that axe head because he's currently sustaining all things. Can you guys see the difference? It's not just that he's a watchmaker doing creation and now he's apart from it. He does creation, and he's intimately a part of it. And this is good news for us. Let's keep going. Verse 18. 
And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning. This is so important for us as a family, as the body of Christ. We're not just joined together by some abstract thing. We're joined together, and Jesus is is our older brother. Jesus is the head. And all things function according to the head. I don't know if you've heard lots of messages on unity or conferences on unity, but beloved, we will never be unified until we understand, until we are unified with the head, with Jesus of Nazareth, because he is our goal. He is the one we work for. He is the beginning. We can try all these different, different topics and different things we can try to be unified, but until Jesus is preeminent in all things, unity is impossible. I, I recently read about a a church that's trying to do small groups because they they really see small groups as a more biblical way of doing church, and and they're struggling. And so one of the the board members said, let's try this. Let's try to do small groups according to what people like. So it is a big church, right? And so they had people who like tennis. Well, the tennis, that will be the tennis small group. And, And people who are really into literature, that can be like the literature small group. And beloved, it's not gonna work. Until Jesus is our head, unity is impossible. So may he be preeminent in all things. Let's keep going. He is the firstborn from the dead. I love love this one, beloved. It's different than firstborn of all creation. Firstborn of all creation is him as the executor of the state. But the firstborn of the dead is a beautiful doctrine. And I like the way that, that Randy Alcorn, no, not Randy Alcorn, Max Lucado talks about it. It's, when Max Lucado was a little boy, him and his brother and his friends, they dug this massive tunnel under the ground. And, and they got the two ends to meet. And now the question is, who's going to go through the tunnel? We, we, we made the tunnel. And if, if, you, if you understand about raising boys, it's not fun unless there's some danger involved. Right? So they say, okay, who's, who's going to go through the tunnel? Everybody's terrified. It's dark. It's scary. You can't even see the other end. And it was made by boys, so it likely is going to collapse and kill them all. And so they think, well, I don't want to do it. Do you want to do it? Finally, Max's older brother says, all right, I'll do it. And so they all kind of pat him on the back encouragingly, but, but they're afraid. And as they watch his tennis shoes disappear through that tunnel, Fear starts to grow in each one of their hearts. What if he doesn't make it through? What if the tunnel collapses on him? And and with each passing moment, fear is growing and growing and growing until the moment that that boy's sandy hair emerges from the tunnel on the other end. And they shout, yes, it works. Come on. Guess what every one of those kids did immediately afterwards? They all went through the tunnel. What happened? What happened to their fear? Why weren't they terrified of the tunnel anymore? Because their older brother faced the tunnel and made it through the other way. Beloved, Jesus has gone to death and he has emerged on the other side with a resurrected body. He is the firstborn from the dead. The reason we don't have to fear death is because if your name is written in the book of eternal life, of resurrection life, you will come through death with a a resurrected body. Amen, hallelujah, correct? You get a resurrected body. You were not meant to die. And if you are found in him, in the sacrifice at the day of the Lord, you will never die. Jesus has defeated death. And that's why it no longer has the sting for Christians. For unbelievers, death is devastating. Absolutely devastating. For us, it's just a seed planted in the garden that will be resurrected, that will, be, that will spring up to new life. And our older brother has done it, beloved. What good news for us. Why? The next part of verse 18, that in all things he might have the preeminence. That in all things Jesus would be supreme. You want to know God's will for your life? That in all things Jesus would be supreme in every area of your life. Now, one day it's going to happen. There is a day set in the future that is unstoppable. The day when Jesus returns to the earth 
takes his throne and is supreme in all things. It's unmovable. It's an unchangeable moment in history. But the question is, will he be preeminent in every aspect of your life? Will he be supreme in every area of my life? Will Jesus be the supreme factor in my work, in my family life, in my viewing habits? Will he be preeminent? And both of those things are held in tension because it's going to happen. The glory of the Lord will cover the earth like the waters cover the sea. And now we pick up our cross so that he would be preeminent in our own lives. Verse 19, for it pleased the Father that in him should all the fullness dwell. (laughs) I I love this. Look at verse, look at chapter two, verse nine. He says it in a different way, but in, in both ways, I love it. Chapter two, verse nine says, for in him all the fullness, or for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Do you guys know that the entire Trinity is in Jesus' body? That, that Jesus would have all the fullness If the Trinity tried to dwell in my body, I would explode into a billion pieces. But Jesus of Nazareth is the glorious one. And all the fullness of the Godhead dwells in him bodily. I love it. Verse 20. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. So if you've been following along this message, hopefully you're seeing Jesus as the glorious God. And you get to this verse and you think, the glorious God died on a cross? The creator who sustains all things shed blood on a cross? And that should be a shocking thing to us. How how can the creator, the, the one who sustains all things, die on a cross? This is the message of the gospel. This is the good news of the gospel. This is one of the reasons we know we cannot have fellowship with Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses because they may say all these good things about family, but they don't believe Jesus is the fully divine creator God. And so when he dies on a cross, it's not divine blood. I don't know about you, beloved, but I need powerful blood to cleanse me of my sin. I need I need God's blood. Because it wasn't just a man that died on the cross. It was God. And and this is the drama of of the the Old Testament. It's the drama of the whole Bible. Because at, at the garden, in the garden, it was men who rebelled. It was Adam and Eve who took the fruit and said, I don't want this man to be king over me. Because it's the knowledge of good and evil. I want to be decide, I want to be the one who decides what's good and what's evil. I don't want somebody else to make that decision. And it's rebellion. So how is God going to reconcile that? How is he going to bring reconciliation back? And, and if you follow the, the drama of the Old Testament, you're kind of like, who, who's going to be able to do this? Who's going to be able to bring human beings back to the Father? Who's going to be able to reconcile them? Because it was men who sinned, therefore it should be men who pay the price. But there is no worthy man. Because Abraham's a liar and Moses has his issues with with yelling at rocks. And, and, And we just have this drama in the Old Testament that there's nobody worthy to pay the price. It's gotta be a human being because humans are the ones that sinned. But every human being is a sinner. So what does God do? God becomes a man. That's how he reconciles all things back to himself. That's how he does it. And it's beautiful and it's glorious and it's, it's about Jesus. Our part in it is so tiny. All we have to do is just trust in it. He's the one that paid the price. Okay, I'm out of time. 
How do we respond to a message like this? First of all, actually, the, the response is in chapter 2, verse 6. Look at chapter 2, verse 6. Here, here is how we respond. As ye, theref- as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. How do you respond to, Genesis, to Colossians 1, 15 through 20? You walk in him. You stay there. The, the, the worst lie from the enemy is that, okay, now you've become a Christian. Now, now you've repented of your sins and you've, you've, you've met Jesus at the cross. Now it's time to do other things. Beloved, that's a lie from the enemy. Once you start in Jesus, you walk in Jesus. You continue in him. When you signed up to be a, a believer, you signed up for endless Christology classes. You signed up to study Jesus of Nazareth, not just until the end of your life, but for endless ages. A hundred billion years from now, you will still be studying Jesus of Nazareth. You will still, you'll behold him with your eyes, but you'll also be in the Bible, reading about him, loving him, knowing him. This is the message that will sustain you. Follow Jesus, continue in him, right? He, he is the vine. You're the branch. Stay in him. Study everything you can about this man of Nazareth. Because in him are all the treasures of of wisdom and knowledge. Well, thank you for listening this morning. Amazing, that's the word that kind of comes to my mind. Amazing, not what David said, but amazing who he talked about. Jesus Christ. If you noticed everything he said about him, nothing focused on man or David's great words or whatever. It was the great subject of Jesus, who he was, what he has done, and what he's going to do in our life and can do. And his challenge at the end, I think, was so powerful. What is your response to what you have heard today? That's something as you walk out the door this after, or this morning. I hope it sticks with you. I hope the Spirit, just like he inspired Brother David today, to speak and to talk to us and tell us who he is and what he has done for us. The same spirit will say, what is your response going to be? You're going to give me most, pretty much, a lot? Or are you going to trust me all the way? I was amazed at just the clarity of the scriptures this morning. And we're so thankful for Brother David's words and thankful for the spirit. I thought as he was speaking from the Zion's heart. We sing this song quite frequently, and it's 202. It's Christ my all. And I'd like to read verse 8. Worship and laud and praise and strength and clarity, O Lord, to thee. Now feeble verily, one day thy praise shall be unclouded, pure and free eternally, but we have a chance right now to praise and worship him for all he's done. Isn't that amazing? The God, the creator, the sustainer became a man to redeem us through his blood and rose from the grave. I liked how David said, hallelujah, amen, because that's what really fires us up, doesn't it? God bless his word. Yeah.
time for a prayer. Brother Howard Herman, uh, would you do that for us? He's back over here on the, the right, a few benches up. No. Let us arise for prayer. Father in heaven, we were humbled this morning. As we have gone through life, we have thought of many things and many things we must do. We listen to many people teach us about all kinds of things and how the Bible speaks this and the Bible speaks that. And we fill our hearts with this chatter and clamor of the world, like my father used to say. And today we had a simple, simple message for us. After reading five or six verses of the Colossians, he summed it up with one thing. Get to know Jesus. Get in the Bible. Understand Jesus. For everything that happens is from Jesus. So we are so thankful Jesus, for Jesus in our lives. We're so thankful to those of us who have picked up the cross and believed in the shed blood of Christ and followed it. Oh, Father, just help us to follow it the whole billions of years in the future, as David said. So we thank you for this morning service, praise you for it, praise that we can walk in it, and we thank you through Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. Amen. Thank you, Brother Howard, for your prayer. Um, do we have any greetings this morning anybody would like to give? Princeville, thank you. Thank you, Dana. Roanoke, thank you, Brother Jacob. Washington, thank you. Thank you for your greetings. have a few announcements here. We have received word that our brother Bob Gangloff's brother, Phil, who's 61 years old, he'd passed away. I understand he had a battle with cancer. And just prayers for our brother Bob and his family as they go through this time. Also, um, I wanted, wanted to announce this, that at the elder conference, we asked for support from the elder body for an ordained deacon, to search out an ordained deacon here in Peoria, and they gave us support for that. So this fall, winter sometime, we'll be going through that process. And so just encourage you to be prayerful for that as we uh, seek out an ordained deacon here in the Peoria Church. Uh, today, the collection boxes are open for ACCFS, Apostolic Christian Counseling and Family Services, helping the hurting, encouraging growth, and nurturing hope. And uh, there are a, a number of uh, helps that they have out there. I encourage you, if you're not familiar with the website, to go out there. 
There are courses out there for people that are going through grief um, and um, sexual purity and just a number of different things that you can access. Also, there are podcasts available. I encourage you to take advantage of those as they support the church. And then um, just uh, on the one thing that I was reminded of, of the ushers, there have been some concerns about those who, uh, as, we, as we leave, we sometimes just gather in the foyer and we don't go all the way out. Encourage you today to try to get all the way out. It's a nice day outside, so just head on out, go out to the front there, and we can fellowship out in front. So this will conclude our service here at 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock. We're looking forward to our other service with Brother Mike Kaisner bringing us the word, and we're looking forward to that, and he would appreciate your prayers, I'm sure. And Brother David, thank you. It was a real blessing today to have you on the pulpit with us and to have you bring us the, the truth of the word. May God bless each one of you as you've gathered today. May we go forward as we've heard in, in teaching and in prayer today that Jesus Christ would be our sole aim.